welcome back to my channel. In the previous class, we have discussed about the male gametophyte that is structure of pollen grain. And the study of pollen grain is called as palynology. Try to remember, the study of pollen grain is called as a palynology. And I told you, pollen grain is the male gametophyte which is usually a circular or spherical. It may be oval in shape, ellipsoidal in shape and usually measures about 25 to 50 micrometers in diameter. So these are some other informations regarding the pollen grain. The study of pollen grains is called as a palynology and we have discussed about the, the, pollen, the structure of pollen grain in detail. In the last class only, I told you the pollen grain is usually made up of two important layers the outer layer is called as exine and the inner one is called as intime. The exine layer is made up of a highly resistant organic material called as sporopollenin. And intime is made up of cellulose and pectin. There are germ pores and germ pore is a region where the sporopollenin is not accumulated. So this is about the structure of pollen grain. In this class, we talk about the importance of pollen grain. We will talk about the importance of pollen grain. So what is the importance of pollen grain? Do you know these pollen grains are rich in nutrients? The pollen grains are rich in nutrients and in the recent years it has become a passion to use the pollen tablets as a food supplement. So as a food supplement, the pollen tablets will be available. The people will start to use the pollen tablets as a food supplement. And in case of western countries, a large number of pollen products are available in the market in the form of tablets and even in the form of syrups. And one more interesting thing about the pollen grain, the pollen consumption will increase the performance in case of athletes and race horses. So these are certain important points we should know about the pollen grains. I told you it is very rich in case of nutrients and it will be available in the form of tablets and syrups. And another interesting thing we can know about pollen grain is this: the large number of pollen grains, they usually cause allergies and bronchial afflictions in some people which later leads to several chronic respiratory diseases like uh, asthma, bronchitis, etc. Not all types of pollen grains, uh, but the several species pollen grains are usually causes uh, allergies in case of people. One of the best example I can give you that is a parthenium. So this parthenium which can be commonly called as carrot grass. So parthenium is the scientific name and carrot grass is the common name. In our local, uh, local language we can call it as uh, Congress Gida. So this is uh, the parthenium. Actually this parthenium it came to India as a contaminant in the imported wheat. So in the imported wheat it has been came to India as a contaminant but nowadays uh, it is ubiquitous. Ubiquitous in the sense we can find everywhere. The parthenium can be seen everywhere which usually causes allergies in many peoples. So that is about the importance. Then, so after the shedding of the pollen grain, in the previous class I told you the pollen grains may shed at a two cell stage or they may shed at three cell stage. So after shedding, what happened to these pollen grains? Where they will grow? Uh, where they will go? And what are the changes will be occurred? So, after the release of the pollen grain, once they shed, they have to land on the stigma. So, stigma that you will study in the female reproductive structure, these pollen grains must be landed on the stigma in order to bring about the fertilization before they lose their viability. Viability is nothing but efficiency to work. Or we can say, before their expiry date, they have to undergo fertilization. Then, what is the viability period? How long the pollen grains can able to retain their viability? That is also very very important. So, we will talk about the viability of pollen. The viability of pollen grains. And the period of viability. The period of viability, it is also greatly variable in different pollen grains. And to some extent, it may be dependent on temperature and humidity. But not all the time. To some extent, the pollen 
grains of viability usually depends upon the temperature and humidity in some cereals like wheat rice etc the pollen grains will lose their viability within 30 minutes of their release so within 30 minutes they will lose their uh, they will lose their viability so within 30 minutes uh, they has to fall onto the stigma they need to bring the fertilization otherwise uh, after 30 minutes uh, the fertilization cannot be seen in in the plants like uh, wheat rice etc then in some other families like uh, rosaceae leguminaceae and solanaceae they can maintain their viability up to several months you may be knowing that the semen are sperms of many animals including humans that can be preserved for artificial insemination. You will study artificial insemination in the next upcoming chapters. So the sperms are semen can be preserved. Similarly, these pollen grains can also be preserved. The pollen grains of different species can be preserved in the liquid nitrogen. In the liquid nitrogen. So the pollen grains, the pollen grains can be preserved in liquid nitrogen under minus 196 degrees Celsius. So that is called cryopreservation. You will study about cryopreservation later. So these pollen grains can be preserved in the liquid nitrogen under minus 196 degree Celsius. Such stored pollen grains can be used later in plant breeding or crop breeding techniques. It is like similar to seed bank. You may be heard about seed bank. Similarly, the pollen banks, the stored pollen grains will be available at pollen banks later that can be used in the crop breeding techniques. So this is about the viability period of the pollen grains. So this is the structure of pollen grain, the importance of pollen grains and viability of pollen grains. So that completes the main reproductive part of the flower. So we have discussed the stamen, the structure of microsporangium, RTS of anther. Later we have been studied about the male gametophyte that is the pollen grain. Now we are moving on to the next aspect, the next oral of the flower that is pistil or gynecium. The pistil or gynecium which represents the female reproductive structure of the flower. Already we have discussed the male reproductive structure that is antrecium or stamen. In this class we are going to talk about the pistil or gynecium which is the female reproductive part of the flower. So this is uh, the female reproductive part of the flower called as gynecium or pistil. So this gynecium or the pistil usually made up of three parts uh, that is stigma, style and ovary. The three parts of the gynecium includes stigma, style and ovary. So this stigma it is uh, the terminal expanded part of the flower and this stigma serves as a platform for the pollen grains because the pollen grains can only germinate on the stigma on the compatible stigma that the compatibility we can study later so why it, uh, it acts as a or it serves as a platform because the pollen grains can only germinate on the stigma so stigma it is the terminal expanded region where the pollen grains will be landed to germinate and a long a long as a style and a basal swollen part of the pistil, it is known as a ovary, which is usually seated on the thalamus part that we have discussed in the introduction class. So, the stigma, style, ovary, these are the three parts of the gynecium or pistil. And within the ovary, within this ovary, there is a there is a ovarian cavity called as locule. So within the ovary, there is a ovarian cavity that is called a locule. The number of locules may be variable. It may be one or it may be many. So the ovarian cavity, the ovarian cavity is called as locule. And this ovary encloses many, one to many structural units called as carpels. So carpels are important. The ovary encloses one to many structural 
other units called as carpels. Actually, the carpels are nothing but megasporopels. Carpels are nothing but megasporopels. If you remember, in case of gymnosperms, microsporopels, megasporopels, megasporopels contain megasporangium. Similarly, even in case of angiosperms, the carpels nothing but megasporopels, which usually contains megasporangium. There is ovary evident later. So here, ovary comprising of the ovary cavity called as locule, and which may contain one to many structural units called as carpels. Carpels are nothing but megasporophylls. And these ovarian cavity, the locules comprises of a parenchyma and as a cushion-like structure. So within this, when we take a transposition of the ovary, we will come to know how the locule will be, how the carpels appears like. And what I am going to say is, a parenchyma and as a cushion-like structure called as placenta, Within the ovarian cavity, there is a parenchyma and as a cushion like structure called as a placenta, and from which the megasporangium or ovules will going to arise. For example, if you consider this is the ovary part, within the ovary, there is a parenchyma and as tissue called as a placenta. From the placenta only, the ovules will going to arise. Ovules are also called as megasporangium. You should remember megasporangium or ovule, both are same. So, from the placenta, the ovules will be arising. You may be studied in the chapter morphology of flowering plants. What is placentation and types of placentation? Everything you studied in the chapter morphology. Now, if it is not required, you just remember from the placenta, the ovules or megasporangium will be arising. And the number of ovules, it may be one to many. Some in some plants, a single gynecium, a single gynecium, a single ovary comprises of a single ovule. So, what is this ovule means? Actually, this ovule after fertilization it develops into seed, and this ovary part only develops into fruit. That all we will study later. We try to remember. To try to remember here the ovules, the number of seeds is equal to number of ovules. So a single ovary may contain a single ovule or a single ovary may contain many number of ovules. For example, in case of uh, uh, paddy, in case of paddy wheat, uh, a single ovary comprises of single seed. Even we can give example mango. A single fruit, a single ovary comprising of a single uh, ovule. And many ovules in the sense, we can take example papaya, watermelon, etc. Where in one ovary, we can find many number of ovules. So that is about uh, ovules. Then, a gynecium may comprising of a carpus. I already told you, these are the structural units which may be one to many. The number of carpus are greatly variable. A gynecium may comprising of a single carpel, which may contain two carpels, etc. They are respectively called as monocarpillary. If a gynecium consists of a single carpel, which is called monocarpillary, example we can give, there is a P. Bicarpillary, where the number of carpels are two, example vinca. Vinca is nothing but Catharanthus roseus that you will go to know later. And tricarpillary, where the number of carpels are three, example castor. And tetracarpillary, number of carpels are four, example datura. And pentacarpillary, number of carpels are five. The best example, hibiscus, that you will be going to study in your practical class. And finally, multicarpillary. Multicarpillary refers to many number of ovules, sorry, many number of carpels within the ovary. Example, citrus. So these are several conditions we can find in case of ovary. The ovary may be monocarpillary, bicarpillary, tricarpillary, tetra, penta, and finally multicarpillary. If the number of carpels are more than one, uh, more than five, which can be called as multicarpillary. If the number of carpels are more, the carpels may be freely arranged or they may be fused. For example, I will draw a simple diagram. If you take a transposition of the ovary, when we 
get a, a transverse section of the ovary. So then here we can find when you observe the placentation, you will come to know. So here I am drawing the carcass which are fused carcass. So these are the fused carcass. In some cases the carcass may be free. So the carcass may be free or fused. For that we are giving a scientific term which is called as syncarpus condition and apocarpus condition. Here syncarpus refers to fused carcass. If all the carpus, the number of carpus may be 5 or more than that, if all the carpus are fused together, it is called as a syncarpus condition. One best example for power, so viniferum, even in case of lady's finger, so syncarpus ovary can be seen. If the number of carpus are usually free, the number of carpus are more and they are freely arranged, such a condition is called as apocarpus condition. Here syn refers to with or fused. fused. Apo refers to they are usually away and the, uh, we can say it is away so syncarpus and apocarpus condition apocarpus condition can be seen in case of mycelia champaka so these are certain conditions we can see in case of ovary so gynecium history which is the female reproductive part of the flower which is mainly made up of three parts stigma sky and ovary within the ovary ovarian cavity is there called as Locule and ovary comprising of many, one to many structural units called as carpels. Carpels are similar to megasporophylls. And within the ovarian cavity, there is a parenchymatous cushion called as placenta. From the placenta, the megasporangium, which is commonly called as ovule, will be arising. Number of ovules may be one to many. It may be one to many. One in case of paddy, wheat, etc. Many in case of papaya, uh, watermelon, etc. And gynecium may comprise of one to many carpels. The conditions will be like this. If the carpels are fused, it is called syncarpus condition. If the carpels are free, it is called as a apocarpus condition. So these are the basic uh, basic things we should know about the gynecium. In the next part, we are going to take about the structure of megasporangium, that is structure of ovule, very very important for your examination.